So I can see we have a few participants now. So I'll just start and say hello to everybody and thank you for coming. I hope uh, you've been enjoying any other sessions that you've been to so far. Um, and um, I'd like to say hello from very warm Bristol. Uh, the panel here today is from uh, dotted around corners of, of the UK and Kenya and Rwanda. Um, really delighted to have um, such a, an interesting range of people here to talk to you all. Um, some of whom I know very well and some of whom I'm meeting for the first time. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed we're not all in a room together to, to catch up and say hello, but it's uh, really lovely to have you all here. Um, so uh, my name's Emily Poskett. I'm the Head of International Development at the Office for National Statistics in the UK. Uh, we're a fairly young uh, international development programme. Uh, we began uh, life five years ago. Um, and we draw on the expertise of, of the UK Office for National Statistics to support uh, partners around, around the world, particularly in Africa. And we have some partnerships uh, with the National Statistics Offices in Rwanda, in Kenya, in Ghana, um, and uh, in Namibia, and also with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Um, several of, of whom of these partners are uh, interested in, in building capability in data science in their own institutions or in the case of the UNECA um, in, in the broader uh, institutions around Africa as well. Um, so uh, yeah, our, our role uh, in the, is to, to try and use ON, some of ONS's expertise the best way we can to support partners. Um, so I, I've been working in statistics and international development for the last sort of 20 odd years um, and I've witnessed a, a wide range of views on the relevance of data science for international development. Um, I think, you know, that, um, that of, there's been an uh, uh, early phase of, of, of large scepticism around data science, around national statistics offices in particular, um, thinking that, that their role is very much to produce the, the top, top quality of data and to take the time in, in doing that to make sure that the statistics are as accurate and robust as they can be. Um, and that, that, that data science doesn't fit within that, those parameters through to those who think that, that data science is a, is a silver bullet for uh, international development and that, you know, uh, have placed great reliance on, 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 on projects that involving innovation of data. And, and for me, the, the truth, and for most people, I imagine, the truth lies somewhere in, in between. Um, I think that um, national statistics offices have a responsibility to examine the data that's out there and the tools that are out there to, to try and support policymakers in the best way that they can. Um, and that if um, data exists uh, in any form, which can improve the, the, the timeliness, the relevance, the granularity of the data which they're passing to, to, to the public and to policymakers, um, that they, they have a responsibility to engage with that or risk becoming kind of obsolete um, and, you know, producing the figures one year after the event when others are doing, doing so much more quickly, et cetera. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're very, very lucky in the UK to have had some investment in, uh, which has enabled us to build data science capability. Um, we have uh, this fantastic resource in the ONS Data Science Campus. Um, and through the years I've been in ONS, we've invited over international visitors from, from all over the world who have come and, and seen the capability that we've got and, and uh, been quite envious. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's fantastic for us that we have the opportunity to, to build that capability here in the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to do the best that we can to, to support others to build um, the capability that they need to, to make the most of the, the data and the technology that's out there. Um, so what we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit today um, about about uh, what why data science capability um, uh, is needed and needs to be built and we're going to talk to um, uh, our eminent panel who can talk a bit about um, projects that they've been involved in of, of building data science capability uh, in different countries around the world. So I'm first um, going to introduce Ivan Morenzi, who's the Deputy Director General of the National Institute of Statistics in Rwanda. Um, and he's going to talk to you all a little bit about the ambitions that, that NISR have for building data science uh, capability in their own organisation um, and the progress that they're making on that. Um, and then I'm going to introduce uh, Tim Harris, who works for the ONS Data Science Hub, 
which is a part of the data science campus dedicated to uh, working on uh, using data science for international development and sits within the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, and um, Tim's going to talk a bit about some of the projects that they uh, that they take forward. Um, I'm then going to introduce Lynette, who comes from the Global Partnership for Statistical, uh, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, and I can never say that right, GPSDD, um, who's a very close part, GPSDD are a very close partner of uh, of the ONS and also of the FCDO um, and work on data science capability building and statistical partnerships around the world, including in Africa. And Lynette's based in the Nairobi office and is the Africa program manager. Um, and then Rich Lation, who is a, a working in the data science campus as a faculty manager and lecturing. Um, and um, he's, he's been in the data science campus since April and has partic is particularly going to talk to us about a program that he was involved in uh, in the Caribbean, which sadly for Rich was not in the Caribbean. It was all over Zoom. Um, <laughs> um, so um, first I'm going to hand the floor to Ivan um, to talk um, about his experiences at NASR. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Emily. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to connect uh, virtually. I hope you can hear me loud and clear, and um, you can also see me. Um, so um, I'll just use a few slides to talk you through our journey at uh, NISR. And I'll keep saying NISR, which is the short form for the National Institute of Statistics of Rwanda. So um, I think my, my story today is sharing um, you know, what we've been up to when it comes to building data science capability in Rwanda. And I'll underline that it, it's about Rwanda, it's beyond actually the statistics office in our case, in our context. Um, and I mean, as I thought of what I'm to share this afternoon, I, I just thought of actually starting with the key messages. And so my slides, uh, in three parts, which are the three messages I want to share this afternoon. One is that from my experience, um, there has to be a clear vision. There has to be a clear vision uh, about what the country wants to achieve. And it's under that vision that actually, in our case, we have raided on and it has set the clear roles for us as, as an office. And without that clear vision at national level, it can be very challenging. I think I would speak the same for UK as well. This the, the office of, of I mean the data science campus was 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 birthed out of a vision at, at high level. That has been the case in Rwanda as well. Um, so I'll talk you through about that vision and our mandate and how it came about. Two um, partnerships, building partnerships. I think this is one of those things which we've we can acknowledge all of us, especially speaking for statistics officers, that it was quite new to us. And we just realized that working with others, learning from others um, would, would help us make better headways. So partnerships in our case have been very instrumental and I will elaborate on that. Um, number three is demonstrating relevancy. I mean, it sounds uh, buzzy, exciting data science, but until we demonstrate how relevant it is in, in, in real projects, then we will struggle to have the buy-in. And I think that's very important. So those are really my three messages, vision, building partnerships, and demonstrating relevancy. So with respect to vision, um, in Rwanda, our journey goes way back, um, I would say 2017, when at national level, there was a clear data revolution policy that was approved by cabinet. So that though was prepared by, by some assessment, data readiness assessment within government that was done. And um, it, it led to the, to the policy on, on, on that on, on how government should approach um, you know the, the, the idea of harnessing big data and within that policy it was made clear that um, the national 
Institute of Statistics of Rwanda would coordinate all activities around big data in the country. So we took the policy um, then and started interpreting it and breaking it down. And we came up with uh, the National um, Strategy for Development of Statistics in 2019. And one of the main pillars in there was um, building data science capabilities within the institution at national level, as well as at national level. Um, so, and several things have evolved after that, obviously leading to that strategy itself. We worked closely with the, with, with the Office of Statistics UK, and some other key things have evolved out of the strategy. We've had the data protection law developed. We have the open data portal and, and other many other things, which really we, we, we are happy about. Um, so, again, stepping back a little bit, um, when we looked at the policy, uh, we realized that quite a number of things we needed to embark on. One was the skills, building skills within the institute, but also partnership within uh, the, the broader sectors to, to see how skills could be built. And this involved working with universities within the country, um, sharing experiences within institutions. Infrastructure was also another key one, um, basically having the appropriate space and IT systems and the like to be able to run this kind of um, uh, vision. Uh, three was the, the, the data sharing, access to data. We're talking of big data here which most of it we knew would come from all other sources beyond statistics office, including um, private sector, uh, other public institutions. So thereby bringing in the legal. So that, that's how the law came in. Uh, the wide partnership will keep coming up, but that was our interpretation of our mandate. You know, skills, infrastructure, laws, or, or, or policies around data sharing, partnership around uh, other things. And, and with that, we knew that would be very key because in, in making the case for data science, we knew we needed to clearly explain that um, with this, it will, one, help enhance our statistical outputs, yes, for us. So the buy-in even uh, within the institution, within other stuff, but also um, develop other insights for decision making that within policies within the private sector and and also improve operational efficiency so so those were the expected um, sort of gains with the, with embarking on this journey so as things evolved uh, it was clear to us that yes our mandate cuts across or goes beyond the institution but along the journey, actually, our mandate expanded to be also a bit regional, um, a bit regional. So, so what we see here by this slide is we're talking about the institutional component and then the national and then the regional, um, which is, I suppose, quite unique from other statistics offices. So there's the huge work of building data science capabilities within the institution, meaning training staff and working on projects that uh, either are um, improving the usual statistical outputs you are doing, but also trying out other things like satellite imagery for, for agriculture. Um, but then there's also supporting other stakeholders. So in this case, we've worked with the legs of the National Bank, uh, the revenue office, um, the regulatory for transport, and other many other stakeholders um, around issues of capacity building, around issues of sharing experiences on how they are approaching this area. And then the third component was the regional one when we were given the opportunity to host the, 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 the regional hub for data science. And that was out of a conference we hosted, I think, way back in 2019, if I recall, or, or 18. And um, so that brought in another mandate at regional level. So with this broad mandate, um, it is on one hand a lot of work, 
but also on the other hand, gives you the opportunities to engage and partner with so many others and, and make headways, which has been at least our case. So, as I said, to us, with this huge mandate, partnerships have been very instrumental. And the key partnership that we've had over the years, right away from 2017, was with the UK Office of National Statistics. And this collaboration has involved uh, having data scientists over to NISR for some period of time, having a, a, a technical advisor based at, uh, at, um, at NISR, and having other data scientists come in for a few weeks, and with that, work with our staff on training them with uh, different um, skills in, in Python, in R, and working on real projects um, just to demonstrate the relevancy, but also building processes and systems. And as I can speak now, we have a fully fledged department of data science of about 13 staff, which, which has been recruited. I think that connects with the vision because it's interesting in Rwanda that right in, in the last year, there was rationalizing of, of staff within government institutions. But in our case, we were able to justify the case of adding more staff. I think that was possible because the vision was clear. NSR had been given this responsibility and this was considered relevant. And so then it was possible for us to have that. But we've also had partnerships with um, o o o o ODI and we've had um, a data scientist with us for two years, uh, Mati. And we've also partnered with institutions of learning, as I said, with other government institutions, with private sector and uh, other international development partners. And lastly, they also the partnership uh, with the um, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa when it comes to the regional hub. So I think the message here is that partnerships uh, in this area are very key. They will enable us, you know, learn, they will enable us um, try out things which others have already tried out. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel and you make better headways. Uh, just to emphasize the regional hub, as I said, was around May 2019 when we hosted this fifth international conference on big data, that we were then given this responsibility. Um, and we it was based on the space we have, but also on the journey we had embarked on, which several other African countries had not yet embarked on. And so it felt like uh, it would be just appropriate to to share from the others. So I think the third part is yes, you 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 set up these systems, you work out these partnerships, but you need to demonstrate the relevancy uh, for this to make sense. Even within your key stakeholders, the staff that you have to, be, to, to get them excited about it and, and really plan, uh, but also to other stakeholders. And uh, so there have been a few projects we've embarked on within the institution, um, the reproducible analytical pipelines, where we've been looking at our economic statistics and trying to look at things we are doing in heavy Excel files and just, you know, reprogram that in R plus our other analytical work in, in like poverty statistics, where we're trying to make that more efficient. But also we've been exploring other ideas around um, analysis of satellite imagery uh, to complement our, 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 our agriculture statistics, plus working along uh, other stakeholders like the National Bank of Rwanda, which I should say I'm a board member and um, that has also been going well. Uh, they also have now a full-fledged unit uh, for data science and there's very, really, very relevant project which they've worked on, which was around, um, you know, this period of COVID where um, there was now promotion of using cash and by analyzing transactions of mobile money, key decisions were taken on waiving uh, fees for some transfers or lowering fees. And that has 
like multiplied so many times the usage of of, of um, cashless services in the country and moved away from cash especially now in this time of covid so the ability to analyze or to engage that huge volume of data from telcos of mobile transactions and therefore make decisions is i think what we are talking about is is the demonstration of the relevancy and and so at high level the buying then happens so i think that's really my key message um in conclusion i would say this is a journey this is a work in progress in our case we are not yet there uh when we started talking about the idea we were building this building so this is really the image i want to leave you with uh, but right now we are excited that this building is complete now and this team i mentioned is going to be housed there our data science campus is going to occupy one of the floors but also we use this building for training capacity building so again it's work in progress we stay hungry and uh, excited about this journey and we look forward to more growth and learning thank you Murakozi chan Murakozi ivan um, thank you very much. Um, that was really interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been seeing in this journey along some parts of the way as well. Um, but um, for those for those who haven't, um, I hope that was a fascinating uh, whistle stop tour of of your great ambitions in this in this space. Um, so I'd like to hand to Tim next, if that's okay, Tim. Uh, to talk about some of the, the work of the ONS FCDO Data Science Hub. Um, thanks very much, Emily, and thanks to Ivan um, for that presentation. Um, National Institute of Statistics Rwanda is one of the key uh, partners that uh, the Data Science Hub uh, works with, um, and it's a, a pleasure to be involved in, in, in some of that work. Um, uh, my name is Tim Harris. I work for uh, the ONS FCDO Data Science Hub. Um, I thought I'd just uh, give you a little bit of background uh, about what that is uh, before telling you a little bit about uh, some of the projects that we do, just so you can uh, see, see where we fit. Um, just as uh, some background, uh, Ivan and Emily have uh, both mentioned the data science campus at the Office for National Statistics, and that really stems from a review of the UK's economic statistics in, in, in 2016, which uh, recommended a greater use of uh, new data sources and, and, and techniques. I don't, I don't think it called it data science at that point, um, but, but that is the, the kind of essence uh, behind its recommendations. And that led to the establishment of the ONS uh, data science campus in around 2017. Um, and that is uh, uh, largely focused on delivering better data uh, for UK government. A couple of years later, um, as part of that data science campus, uh, the Office for National Statistics and uh, what was the Department for International Development, DFID, uh, set up uh, the Data Science Hub. Um, and that's the team I, I work within. We're just a small team of about 10 people. Um, and uh, we are part of the data science campus, but we sit within what is now the Foreign Commonwealth and development office. And our role really is to try and use data science uh, to produce better data uh, for international development. And within that, we have uh, three particular uh, roles. We do uh, uh, some project work, building some tools using uh, new data sources and data science techniques. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a flavor of some of those in a moment. Uh, and then two other areas, uh, training and uh, mentoring. Um, I won't cover in detail uh, in my presentation. Uh, Rich later on will uh, talk about some of the work in the Caribbean um, that he's been involved in. And that really has been a collaboration between uh, the Data Science Campus, which he works for, uh, and, and uh, work from the Data Science Hub as well. So that will, I hope, illustrate some of the training and mentoring uh, work that we're involved in. And we've been doing some training and uh, mentoring with uh, NISR in Rwanda and uh, other uh, statistics offices as well. Um, but I thought I'd just give you a quick uh, overview of some of the uh, different types of projects uh, that we're involved in. Um, a lot of them are using satellite imagery. Um, I, I, I guess because uh, the, the, there's great potential in using satellite imagery, it uh, uh, often has uh, global coverage, uh, more of it is becoming uh, uh, available, uh, some of it is available free of charge, um, it's uh, available uh, on uh, uh, a good frequency, in, in many cases these satellites uh, pass over uh, the, same, the same area um, often uh, sometimes daily, sometimes weekly. Um, and uh, there's, 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 a, there's a great potential uh, there to use uh, satellite imagery. Um, so just uh, these are three examples of uh, areas that we've been uh, involved in in the data science hub. Um, we've been trying to look at uh, whether we can uh, 
estimate the number of cattle in South Sudan. That's the image there on the left. Uh, that image there shows uh, the outline of a, a cattle camp in, in South Sudan. And uh, that's a high resolution satellite image uh, there, about uh, 50 centimeters uh, for each uh, pixel. And I think I'm gonna have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in, in, in the session. So I won't dwell on that too much uh, now. Uh, the, the, the middle image there, um, is in relation to a project uh, that we were doing, trying to estimate the number of trucks in East Africa. Um, in uh, in, in, in de the developed world, we have uh, uh, different systems for measuring the amount of road traffic um, and uh, changes in that, so we can look at uh, changes in trade and economic activity. Um, less of that in uh, many developing countries. And so we've been trying to use um, Sentinel-2 imagery, uh, which is free uh, um, uh, satellite imagery, um, at uh, the 10 meter resolution. So pretty uh, low resolution satellite imagery, each pixel is about 10 uh, meters uh, by 10 meters. Um, but we can use a particular feature of this imagery where the red, the green and the blue light is captured at a very fractionally different uh, time. Um, so if you've got a large moving object um, uh, going uh, 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 along um, at the time the image is captured, you get this rainbow effect. And so in that middle image there, you can see little uh, rainbow uh, dots. Uh, and, and each of those, when, when you can see them on the road network, as, as, as you can see there, um, is uh, pretty likely to be a, a large uh, vehicle moving um, at uh, um, a, a particular speed. Uh, and so we can uh, get a measure from that, uh, we hope, uh, of uh, the number of uh, trucks in a particular area. And then the, the, uh, the image on the right there is uh, from uh, Uganda. Uh, the Welsh government has a, a tree planting project. It's been doing it for about 10 years or so. I think it aims to uh, plant about 25 million trees uh, in this area of Uganda um, before 2025. Um, and they know exactly where the trees have been planted. They've got GPS locations for them. But what hasn't really happened yet is uh, a, a kind of uh, investigation of the impact of that. So we're, again, trying to use uh, free Sentinel uh, to imagery uh, to, to, to look at that. And we can get uh, a classification of uh, uh, whether an area is forest or not and see how that has changed. So those images show a change from 2016 at the top um, down to 2021 um, at, at, the, at the bottom. And uh, we're, we're just using that low resolution imagery at the moment. Um, in time, uh, we may want to um, uh, see whether it's worthwhile purchasing some higher resolution uh, imagery there. So that's a few of the satellite imagery projects um, that, that we're doing. Um, other areas we're looking at, um, this is uh, from a data source called the uh, Automatic Identification System, AIS uh, data, and it uh, is data from transponders on ships uh, around the world. All ships above a certain size and all passenger ships have to carry one of these transponders. Uh, and they uh, give information about the location of that vessel um, every every minute or so. Um, so there are there are uh, uh, literally billions of data points in this data set. Uh, so uh, you know people often talk about data science or big data. Uh, this this data source tr truly is uh, big big data. And and from it we can. Um, get information about uh, what kind of vessel it is, where it's come from, where it's going to, uh, whether it's a tanker, whether it's a, a bulk carrier, whether it's a, a container uh, ship. Uh, we can see how long it spends in certain uh, places. We can get a little bit of information about uh, what it's carrying, how fast it's going and so on. And in the UK, they use this as a, a, an indicator of economic activity. Um, so they look at the number of ships coming into and out of ports in the UK as a, an early indicator of uh, changes in economic activity. So we can get uh, information in advance of the GDP uh, figures, which are produced with a, a month or a six week uh, lag at best. Uh, in East Africa, we're really uh, trying to look at it uh, with an organization called Trademark East Africa, uh, which tries to facilitate trade and uh, look at uh, port efficiency uh, in Mombasa and Dar es Salaam and, 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 and so on. They have a limited uh, amount of information that they collect manually on, on the ships. And that chart on the right shows uh, waiting times um, in uh, of ships entering the port of Mombasa. And the, the red line is the, the, the data that uh, the port authority has themselves. Um, and the black line is uh, estimates that uh, we've been producing from this AIS shipping data. Um, has uh, certain advantages. Um, we can produ produce it more timely. Uh, there's uh, no uh, gaps. You can see from the red lines, there's some, some gaps in the, the manual data. Um, and we can produce uh, some variability around uh, the central um, averages as, as, uh, as well. So we're seeing uh, what uh, use we can put that shipping data to. 
Then just the final area of uh, work that we are uh, beginning to explore is in the, the area of natural language processing. Uh, this is really getting a, a computer to, to, to look at text uh, information and try and uh, interpret it and make sense of it. Um, so we can look at uh, news feeds from uh, organizations like BBC Monitoring, which connects, collects news feeds from uh, organizations around the world, Twitter feeds, uh, other social media. Um, and using uh, natural language processing, uh, trying to uh, look at uh, the, the text within it, we can uh, try and um, identify uh, particular issues. So one of the areas that we're, we're uh, beginning to explore is around uh, violence against women during election times and looking at uh, online um, 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 violence and uh, actions against women in, in social media and, and, and so on. Uh, and so we're uh, uh, looking at work that has been done in, in Zambia by the National Democratic Institute. Uh, they've developed some kind of lexicons of, uh, of words that are relevant in that context. And, and we're trying to see uh, how easy it is to identify um, information uh, from social media, Twitter and so on, uh, to try and uh, see uh, the levels of that, who it's aimed at uh, and, and so on. We've also been uh, looking at the International Aid Transparency Initiative database um, and uh, trying to explore whether we can uh, build a search engine um, that uh, is, uh, uh, performs better than some of the existing search engines around that database, which is a very rich source of development information. Um, so those are just uh, a few um, kind of headline uh, areas that we're working in. Um, I think I'll uh, leave it there. And uh, as I say, I think uh, there'll be an opportunity to come back and uh, look at one of the satellite image uh, projects uh, in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, but I shall leave it there. Emily, uh, back, back to you. Thanks very much. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, yes, as Tim mentioned, we're, we'll, we'll dive into some of those projects in a little bit more depth. Um, I think perhaps it might be best to go to Rich next, if that's okay with you, Rich, um, just because it might flow on from what Tim was saying, um, that, uh, that the work uh, that they're doing really has two components, and that's, that's the project side and the kind of training and mentoring side, and that flows quite nicely into what Rich is going to talk about. Um, so over to you, Rich. I'm Richard Lyshen. I'm the temporary head of faculty at the Data Science Campus um, in the Office for National Statistics based in Newport, UK. In this presentation, I will go through the reflections of our reproducible analytical pipeline in our uh, learning journey that was delivered in collaboration with Statistics Canada. And as Tim mentioned earlier, um, with the FCDO hub, um, two delegates from Caribbean National Statistical Organizations. And this program was delivered starting in September of 2020. So it was completely remotely delivered. Uh, we were all in a, some form of a lockdown and working from home. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, this was not what we planned when we initiated this work uh, some months before. I'll briefly go over the context, the impact, and the lessons learned in this presentation. So beginning with the context, uh, you can see the, the program aims here listed. Um, suppose the, the, the greater overarching focus this time was to, to move uh, lecture time away from kind of handholding delegates through training content and actually getting them to use that time to interact and engage with the audience and to help the analysts build uh, 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 analytical pipelines um, with the training content. So the focus was shifting towards applying the learning from, from the training um, uh, instead. We were able to offer some flexibility in this learning program from the off. Uh, you can see here that the two main um, the two main uh, streams that we offered. One was called Advancing in R, which required less commitment from the delegates and involved no project work. Whereas the full RAP program included more courses over a longer period of time, uh, crucially involved some project development and mentoring, which was a key difference. And at the bottom line in this table here, you could see how many individuals adopted uh, uh, those different streams. This is a snapshot of the training core schedule for each of these 
uh, each of these streams. Um, you can see that in the full RAP program, there was a lot more emphasis on version control, statistical production, and reporting with R markdown. So I should have mentioned earlier that the framework that was elected by the delegates was uh, the R programming framework in this instance. Four colleagues from two from the Data Science Campus and two from Statistics Canada um, were involved in facilitating this program. Myself and Dr. Laurie Baker from the Data Science Campus were involved in planning and delivering of the training content. And this was supported by two analysts from Statistics Canada who uh, co-piloted the sessions, fielding questions and answers. And all four of the, the named people here committed to facilitating the, the ongoing mentoring relationship in this program also. This is an overview of what the, the program looked like for the delegates. You can see here that uh, the, the, the course facilitation was a mixture of independent and remote delivery. Although the sessions were quite short in nature, around three hours long, and these were recorded for posterity um, uh, to be shared with, with the delegates. These, these courses were then followed up with a, either a live coding or a question and answer follow-up session. And these proved to be very important indeed, as it allowed us to uh, take some of the challenges that were being encountered in the project mentoring and also in a, um, a Slack workspace that we use to offer asynchronous support to our delegates. Uh, some of those challenges then could be packaged up into learning opportunities for the entire uh, cohort. So they proved to be quite important. Um, I mentioned the project mentoring. This was done on a monthly basis and supported over a Slack workspace as needed. This involved sharing code and data. Um, so we did uh, emphasize uh, the importance to use open data in these projects and all of the projects involved open data. The program culminated then in a series of peer show and tells where the project teams presented the outputs of their RAP projects to colleagues involved, enrolled within the program. This slide is really to emphasize the importance of recording the sessions and providing the Slack support to complement the training. A few of our delegates, which were all working from home at the time, had severe connection issues in various locations across the Caribbean. Um, and a lot of the positive feedback we, we were provided at the end of this uh, training program was that the video recordings in particular in a downloadable format were particularly useful for some people who are struggling to engage with the live sessions. This gives you an idea of the kinds of projects that our delegates were proposing and working upon. And all of these uh, culminated in automation to some extent. I was involved in mentoring the labor force survey for Antigua and Barbuda and also uh, the quarterly trade bulletin for Trinidad and Tobago. On to some of the impacts very briefly. So some of the key outcomes from this is that we, we had seven projects um, by the end of this uh, uh, program of study, uh, which basically presented programmatic solutions to some of the, the core statistical outputs that these NSOs were working upon year on year or by quarter. And this obviously presents many efficiencies to those statistical productions um, in time and um, finances spent on developing the outputs. We also had 21 trainees that showed evidence to some degree um, in increasing their competence in open source statistical software. Uh, looking at a lot of the pro project proposals at the start of the program, uh, there were a lot of proprietary softwares being mentioned um, and we were very happy to be moving them towards, towards an open source framework. 
So this gives you a flavor of some of the feedback we received. So this was a respondent to our survey following the reproducible reporting using our markdown course. And you can see that they mentioned the importance of the project in providing an opportunity to test how, how much they'd learned from the course. And we really value that immediate ability to apply the learning to a realistic context. We think that is a, an effective way within a data science campus to embed learning and skills. And this respondent to the data wrangling in our survey uh, commented upon the extra attention that they received from instructors during the mentoring sessions. And then on to the lessons learned uh, from, from delivering this, this uh, learning, learning journey. There was a considerable time difference at various points in the year. We had issues with British summertime, et cetera. Um, uh, and therefore, the asynchronous support really came out as something that was really important. Uh, the, the short, focused nature of the training sessions received lots of positive feedback also. And I mentioned the recording of the sessions earlier due to the connection issues experienced by some of our delegates in the Caribbean. In terms of the hands-on workshops, um, they were very important in translating issues raised in mentoring sessions into learning opportunities for the entire group. We were able to respond to emerging priorities, such as uh, allowing a bit more uh, guidance around producing HTML tables and extracting data from PDFs, which didn't quite come up in the, in the project proposal at the start, but was obviously something that became a priority as we progressed through the learning pathway. And then finally, on to the mentoring and the projects. And this was um, a valuable opportunity for additional support for our delegates. But it, it was also really important that the lecturers learned um, from the areas in which the delegates were finding it easy to apply their learning and the areas from where they were uh, struggling and encountering challenge. And that has really informed our, our training, particularly around the introductory training modules that we offer. Lots of support was required in helping our delegates to generalize their code, refactoring solutions um, and uh, writing efficient code. And I would also like to ask you if you would like to consider the training opportunities available to you. Um, uh, we, we have a remit of working with the UK public sector and we collaborate with the FCDO hub in building capability uh, overseas. Please do reach out to us on the email here, datasciencecampus at ons.gov.uk or reach out to us via Twitter at DataSide Campus. Many thanks for your time. Thank you, Rich. I think that was that was really clear and uh, really interesting uh, to hear about the, the journeys in the Caribbean. And um, yes, perhaps we'll come back to hearing a bit more about one of those projects in a bit. Um, so I'd just uh, finally like to hand to Lynette um, to talk about some of the work of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data in Building Data Science Capability. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Lena Komboka. Greetings from uh, a cold and rainy Nairobi. Um, I, I am the Africa Program Manager at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. Uh, and uh, I lead our capacity development work. At the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, uh, we are a network working together to ensure um, the new opportunities of the data revolution are used to achieve the sustainable development goals. And some of the things that we have done ensure that our network improves data uh, and uses data really at the core and at the center to monitor and achieve the sustainable development goals created um, and to pretty much give incentives for new commitments that can fund and share data. Uh, we have offices in Africa, we have a colleague in Guinea, Kenya, and Nigeria. We have offices in the UK, the US, and uh, Latin America. So really, how does our capacity development work? 
Uh, our focus area um, areas have been four. Uh, we work in business and economic uh, monitoring using scanner data. We do data leadership and management. We've actually just finished that training. And on this, we focused on data ethics, risk management, business process mapping, data contracts, and in infrastructure modernization. Uh, we have trainings on GIS and app observation, especially with a focus on climate change. And finally, of course, we have uh, uh, training in data science. I'll focus a little bit on the training that we've had on data science. So um, early this year, we uh, kicked off with one of our partners, the African Institute for Mathematical sciences, um, focusing primarily on enriching, uh, but also just bringing on civil servants. And someone said something that I, I carry on since the training. We are trying to create a critical mass of uh, data scientists within civil service. Um, within this uh, training, we actually worked with 14 countries uh, for a period of one month. And during this time, they were taken through everything from introduction to data science, what it is to Python programming, to you know, data visualization analysis, to data communication. Um, and this went really well. And after the initial uh, one month of training, uh, and we had uh, about 60 participants who went through this training, we decided to reinforce these skills um, by picking five countries that would receive data fellows. And who's a data fellow? A data fellow, in our case, was basically an alumni of the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, or AIMS for short. Um, and they were embedded within a government institution to deepen the skills and share knowledge, especially around uh, data science. Um, so what we did in picking these five countries is we, we uh, sent us a call for expression of interest. And in a call for expression of interest, we ensure that the countries we picked had some kind of use case that was one viable, but also that had some kind of support, especially institutional support. So um, our call for expression of interest was to allow the countries to, you know, look within the organizations and see whether they had the right capacity, the right kind of support, the right kind of interest to be able to receive a fellow because we did not want to end up in a situation where we're giving a fellow and um, they're pretty much not doing uh, anything or not working uh, on anything. So the five countries uh, that received fellows were Somalia, Ethiopia, Senegal, Malawi, and Ghana. Um, and they worked with the countries for four months. The fellowship actually ended last week um, at, the end of, um, at the end of August. So they were there for four months. They worked on very interesting projects. Uh, for example, in Malawi, uh, the use case was on child protection and early marriages. In Ethiopia, working at the ECA, the uh, Economic Commission for Africa, under the UN Economic Commission for Africa, was working on price statistics from across Africa. And basically what the fellow there did was write script that would go out to the internet, you know, crawl through the internet and get price statistics from all the countries in Africa because they published that information. Um, so previously there was someone who at the ECA had to go into various sites um, and collect all this information. Uh, and that was very tedious. And, you know, this fellow came in, wrote a script and it would just collect all that information and put it in one uh, portal and do some very basic analysis that would allow them to uh, pretty much very easily consume that information. In Ghana, the, you know that in July, they just finished their uh, housing and population census. Uh, the fellow there was working on a portal that would uh, visualize, analyze that data. This is the first time that uh, something like that has happened. In Somalia, the focus was on COVID-19. Uh, so a portal just basically comparing uh, the cases in Somalia versus the cases in East Africa, in Africa, and also uh, globally. So for the government of Somalia to know their position uh, when it comes to COVID-19. And then in Senegal, uh, the use case there was uh, focused on climate change um, and forest cover. Um, and all these projects had an element of capacity, skills, and knowledge transfer, because we were very keen on ensuring that um, the fellows did not come in, work on one thing, and then move away. The question was, um, you know, how do we make sure that the projects that they are working on can stay on within these organizations and that they can be improved and actually uh, used? One of the main motivating factors around our capacity development when it comes to data science just really goes back to the introduction of what we do. 
as a network, we our work is really to broker relationships between technical partners uh, from around the world and our partners, you know, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, and wherever we really do our work. And one thing that we realized was we bring in these technical partners who come in with technical um, tools, technical skills, um, come work with uh, these institutions. And at the end of it, when they go away uh, for whatever reason, the countries remain without very concrete skills to be able to continue the work. Um, if any of you have been in our meetings, when you're meeting new partners, one of the questions we ask is, are there open source alternatives? Just in case license fees, for example, um, are very expensive. If the countries wanted to use open source alternatives to be it GIS tools or you know, data science tools, uh, population estim estimation tools, uh, climate tools, that they can in the meantime even have practice tools without the licenses, especially given uh, the cost and if um, it's out of budget. So we decided to also, you know, complement the work that we do in terms of brokering and bringing together, um, you know, these partnerships with enriching skills, um, deepening, you know, knowledge, uh, doing peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. We have countries, you know, meeting very frequently, just exchanging knowledge of the experience with, you know, certain partners. Before we introduce new partners, we do those peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. And we have seen that that is starting to, um, you know, change the scene and that is starting to uh, actually move things. Data science is, while it's looking like an old idea, is still very new, especially in civil service. Um, early on, uh, Emily was, you know, asking uh, about, you know, this idea of data science and, and um, national statistical offices and whether, you know, what their focus really is, uh, whether it's to make sure that, you know, we have access to good, clean data or it's to go a step deeper. For a lot of these organizations, they have still not made that leap. And those are the things that we are now trying to introduce. Those are the things that um, at the Global Partnership, we're trying to kind of whet their appetite on what really is possible without depending too heavily on private sector. But also, um, of course, we cannot do away with private sector. That is not the idea. But that when private sector comes in, there's some level of equalization uh, when you meet at the table that, you know, the civil servants also understand some of these concepts and that when private sector is coming in, they come in to deepen the skills, they come in to provide tools that can actually be used um, and kind of eliminating some of those very expensive processes that then go in, uh, especially when you have governments that are not ready uh, with the skills and the tools um, that, that are required. Uh, I think I'm going to stop there. I know that we have more um, to come so thank you for engaging me um thank you um yeah thank you I was, um, I was just saying thank you to you uh that was very interesting for me uh to hear about the great progress of, of some of the the projects um uh like the, the fellowships and the, and the training as well um as well as to hear of your experience from around the continent um uh, Lynette, I will go back to you straight away. Actually, I think it will work best that way. Um, could you could you tell us about a, a particular data science project that you think that has captured your imagination, or you think shows great potential, or um, you know otherwise will be of interest to the group? I I. <laughs> So some of the projects that I have mentioned uh, that we're working with, with the fellows, I think for me have been the great introduction to the work happening uh, in data science, especially the introductory um, kind of points. But one that I would really like to uh, focus on uh, would be Senegal. Uh, which, um, you know, before this, and, and when we talked to, to the uh, um, host there at IPAR, um, they mentioned that now from having the fellow, they are confident enough to want to apply for grants and work around AI. Um, so it's not a very specific project, but for me, it's that movement in, in terms of the confidence um, from not having any idea uh, to being at a place where now they are really excited about this and seeing the possibilities um, as well. Uh, for example, as well in Malawi, where they're working on uh, child protection and early marriages, um, one of the things that you know the host institution there told us is 
the fellow every week trains about three uh, you know, staff members in Python, which is something that they did not have. Most statisticians uh, you know, are trained in R, um, or of course using uh, different tools. So that they are now committed, and because our um, uh, funding is coming to an end for this particular uh, track of work, what they are even considering is bringing on board the fellow as a consultant to continue that training. So for me, it's not specific um, projects yet because I also think within civil service in Africa, uh, where I operate, it's still very early, uh, very early for uh, a very concrete, you know, all the way uh, project. But for me, it's that appetite that I'm starting to see that the government is now starting to make investments, that's starting to get that interest and starting to see the possibilities of what could happen with data science. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. I, I get your excitement. That's fantastic. Um, Tim, would you like to tell us about one of the, the projects that you mentioned earlier? Um, which, which one of the projects that the Hub's been involved in um, excites you the most? So would you like to tell us a little bit more about? Everyone is very excited about the cattle counting project. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's, 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 it's good because it's, it's visual. Um, and I, I guess, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the starting point is, well, wh why are we bothering uh, to do this? Um, and um, I guess, you know, in, in South Sudan, uh, livestock and cattle in particular is a very part, important part of the economy. Um, uh, some estimates put it uh, uh, as much as a quarter or a third of the economy, but, but pretty much there's a complete absence of um, hard data on it. They did have a um, agricultural census about uh, 20, 25 years ago when uh, the, the, the whole of Sudan was, was, was a single country, but really numbers have just been extrapolated since then and there's no real uh, um, accurate data. Um, it, it's also quite difficult to get accurate data because of the fragile uh, nature of the uh, environment there, the, the, the uh, post-conflict um, cattle actually in, in South Sudan is a very sensitive uh, issue in terms of uh, wealth and uh, people aren't uh, uh, often uh, willing uh, to give information on that. So, so we've got an absence of information, uh, we've got difficulty in getting information, how then uh, can we make some progress? Um, so on, on high resolution satellite images, uh, again this is one uh, 50 centimetres for one pixel, um, increasingly zoomed in, you, you, you can see that as you zoom in, uh, you can see uh, the uh, groups of cattle there in the bottom left of the main image, and then uh, if, you, if you zoom in, uh, you can just about see uh, individual cattle, but you can't, you, you can't really count them. Um, but in South Sudan, what we have got is that very distinct footprint of what a cattle camp looks like. So this is an area where in the dry season, uh, the cattle um, are collected at night. Uh, um, groups of farmers bring their cattle together. And over time, the ground gets worn down and you get this distinct uh, footprint. Um, and uh, you can you can identify that. Um, now, e e even if we could identify individual cows on high resolution imagery, and, and perhaps you could if you had drone imagery or, or, or something or something like that, um, it wouldn't be practical over the whole country. It'd be far too expensive. Um, so we've tried to take a, a kind of step by step um, process. Uh, first of all, starting with free imagery. Um, so on the left there, we've got um, the Sentinel-2 imagery, which I, I talked about previously. Uh, one pixel is 10 meters by 10 meters. Uh, this is available free of charge. And you can just about pick out the cattle camp image there. Uh, and what we try and do is uh, we try and tag uh, some of those uh, cattle camps um, so that uh, the, the, the computer uh, knows what they look like. Uh, and then using machine learning processes, uh, we try and determine uh, where there are other cattle camps um, in, in, in the country using this free um, satellite imagery. Then we want to work out whether the cattle camps um, are still being used or not. Um, some of them will be historic. Um, and so we can then use a slightly higher resolution imagery, three meter um, resolution imagery, where, where we have to pay a little bit for, the, for this. Um, but we can look at it uh, over changes over uh, every, every few days and see how the kind of texture of the landscape changes or doesn't change. Um, and if the texture of the landscape is changing, then uh, we can infer from that that the cattle camp um, is being used. And then when we know where the cattle camps are and we know which ones are being used, we, we, we would then know where to buy um, a, a high resolution um, satellite imagery to be able to uh, look in more detail. Uh, but as I said, we can't actually uh, 
always count the numbers of individual cows. Uh, so what we're looking for in particular is other features that are related to the number of cows, maybe campfires. Uh, they, they, light, they light fires, not for warmth, um, but to generate smoke uh, to keep uh, insects off the cattle. And they have a certain number of campfires per, um, a, uh, per, per certain numbers of, of cattle. So if you can count the campfires, you've got a, a pretty good idea of uh, the cattle. Also, we're looking for uh, ground truth information. Um, there are vaccination programs uh, being taken taking place uh, by the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, and they can give us information on uh, where the cattle are, who, how many are being vaccinated, and then we can get a, try and get a satellite image at the same time as that, and, and, and put all this information into models. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we're not there yet. Uh, try and produce some estimates of cattle uh, numbers in South Sudan. And we've had interest in in, in looking at uh, uh, the applicability of these methods in in other countries as well. Uh, and also, um, you know. The methods that we're developing really are, are trying to identify small features in a large landscape, so small um, areas of cattle camps in a large landscape, uh, and we think that has applicability across other topic domains as well. Um, so uh, we're we're quite interested in in, in that, and it uh, produces some good images and pictures to go alongside it as well. Thanks, Emily. It certainly does. Um, and you know, uh, I think it, I think it's become your your signature dish, isn't it? The uh, uh, when people talk about the hub, uh, the cattle counting project gets gets quite a lot of coverage. Um, brilliant, thank you, um, Ivan. Can we turn to you? I wonder if you could tell us about a data science project, either in Rwanda or one that you're aware of elsewhere, that particularly captured your imagination and and helped you to think about the the potential that data science offers you. Yeah, um, I think the one which is work in progress is the um, potential of analyzing um, uh, satellite imagery to inform our agriculture statistics. And I, as I earlier mentioned, this is something we've uh, we've started looking at. How, uh, as you know, there's lots of available images that we can access in terms of looking at uh, weather patterns and changes in in weather across different parts of the country, but also going further in terms of uh, looking at uh, the crops, the variety of crops in the gardens. Um, it is more challenging in our context where we have a lot of uh, mixed cropping, where you have on small plots of land, um, farmers growing a variety of crops. But even with that, we have um, patterned with a, with a private company recently um, to to use drones, which can be thrown very close to 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 the to the gardens, and and be able to take very good pictures, high resolution pictures. And the idea is that um, what you can complement that high level. Uh, uh, images with with the other other images that we can access from from other sources and and be able to to interpret the the, the crops that have been grown on a given plot of land by land sizes and potentially also the harvest all this is being done by obviously sending people to work with farmers they're always on the field so I think that would be a huge breakthrough because agriculture is still a very relevant uh, part of, of, of our economy and so being able to better estimate the, 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 the magnitude and, and the output of agriculture based on, on that kind of technology would, would really be a big, big breakthrough. Yeah, so that's the one I can focus on things. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, and Rich, finally to you, um, I know the projects you worked on in the Caribbean were a different type of project, uh, maybe not, not so many pictures of cows and things like that, but uh, reproducible analytical pipeline projects, which nevertheless are extremely important and one of the really important uh, developments that data science has enabled. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about one of those projects um, and explain why wraps are important too. <laughs> I would love to. Thank you very much, Emily. Yes, certainly not as visual as some of the, uh, the satellite imagery we've been uh, shown in the last few uh, examples. But yeah, uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about the quarterly trade bulletin that I was involved in mentoring uh, with Trinidad and Tobago during the, uh, the RAP training that we offered to the Caribbean. And actually, from the outside, you could imagine in terms of like the, the public of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, 
the output of this pipeline would not have looked any different at all to what they'd previously done, um, as it was merely um, a, a set of visuals that were used to inform a report. But what was really important for me from the mentoring perspective was to see the journey of the learner going from somebody who was quite competent in Excel and Access, uh, but not, not uh, any, any experience at all in, in programming, uh, and the story of benefits for the organization in being able to just kind of hit run in future years was, was, was quite important for me. Um, so yes, the quarterly trade bulletins, all they were really is a, a simplified set of tables, um, aggregates of imports and exports uh, uh, grouped by, by each sector. And in, um, at the start of the proposal, it was clear that this was done in proprietary software. So the data was held um, within a Eurotrace suite, if you're familiar with this platform, but then ingested to Microsoft Access um, and then processed in Excel. And then the report output was produced in Microsoft Word. So this is the kind of, the, the, and it is a lot of manual intervention to get it to that point. Um, it wasn't particularly complex, uh, but it was a really strong candidate for efficiencies, which, uh, you know, it's a bread and butter output for the organization and something that we really enjoyed uh, experiencing some of the breakthroughs with the, the, the delegates on, on uh, achieving this wrap. Um, it provided a lot of insights also into where our training material assumptions, made assumptions about the learner's competence if they had no programmatic experience whatsoever. So working within the RStudio IDE, for example, and knowing the difference between uh, code that's stored in a script to running code in a console. Um, and at which point in the pipeline, it was, it was uh, most efficient to you know, pivot the data from a wide format to a long format and in helping them to refactor, ensuring the code is minimal readable and reproducible. So all those things were really covered off really well in this project. And sharing in those little breakthroughs as we progressed through the development was very rewarding indeed. Uh, it did a really great uh, job of reinforcing where variation in the data fields needed to be considered on quarters going forward um, and what features of the data set could be relied upon to remain constant um, and for within certain parameters and where some unit tests would be useful in ensuring that you know, we could uh, introduce some control flow and, and certain behaviors to the pipeline if certain conditions were not met. So all of that made for a really good uh, instance of a, a, a wrap that was good to learn within. Um, and also what was really useful in this context, because we had somebody who was very competent in Excel and Access, is drawing analogies to those areas of confidence to the new programming framework in which they were learning. So for example, if you are familiar with the R framework and, and particularly the tidyverse, um, doing something like a group by function followed by a summarize function um, is a very similar set of processes to what you would achieve in Excel with a pivot table. So that really um, helped to cement some of these processes with the, the delegates that we were working with. Um, and then in discussing with the mentees and the mentees line manager, the outcomes of what was obviously a core analytical outcome for the NSO, um, and they are currently considering upskilling more of the team to help improve uh, the, uh, the resilience for this specific programming framework moving forward. You can see that they're really buying into this reproducible story and moving that forward for the organization. Thank you very much. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, I think. Um, I wondered if anybody had a question for any of the members of the panel. Would any members of the audience like to raise their hand at all? Um, well, if no, if no audience have got any questions, um, then um, I might just quickly uh, turn to Ivan again and say, um, um, is there anything that you would like to uh, reflect on in terms of 
what works and what doesn't work for you in terms of a kind of skills transfer programs and what what lessons can we learn for kind of um capacity building type programs going forward yeah um i think that's uh, a really relevant question because we we, we are all um uh, working on on building capacity and from my experience what we've not, what we've noted is that um You've got to first of all identify interested uh, um, staff because this is not something you should just push on to everyone. Uh, it's got to be people really eager to learn, and and the way you kind of assess that is one by um, yes, opening it up to as many as they are from across, you know, departments, but at making some assessment which looks at for example, if someone has already been, you know, learning on their own, um, that, in my view, gives an indication that uh, yes, this is the kind of person who is who is really uh, ready and and eager to learn, other than just um, just just bringing in everyone. So so that's the first thing: identifying the right people. Number two is, um, you know, having the the, the right trainers, people who really have worked on this uh, on these skills, the programming and all that, and worked on real projects, um, so that they they can you know explain the concepts and the ideas, but also use real examples, and if possible also uh, actually in the training um, pilot real projects. I think that's what Richie uh, explained in, in their work. And uh, I'll, I'll be interested to you know follow up with Richie. But also in our case, um, it, it's something that we found at least that um, becomes more uh, practical other than just doing the theory. Um, so I think that is is how you 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 enhance some skills, but leadership is key in, in this kind of endeavor. To be able to follow through and um, assess how things are going, try out something else, um, uh, because sometimes we may assume we've ticked these programs of trainings have happened, but in the end, you look back and you you really can't feel um, what has been realized, given what you expected of people to do, and so I think that that close follow up is is also very key. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think in the interest of time, I think that's a really good note on which to end this session. Um, um, unless any any of the speakers have a burning thing they want to say for, for one minute uh, <laughs> about other, other factors that they've learned. But I'm, you know, I think I've been summed it up really well. Um, so I'm happy to leave it there. But thank you for everybody for coming and, and, and staying with us. Um, it's been really great uh, talking to everybody. Uh, thank you to Ivan and to Lynette and to Richard and to Tim um, and for dining in from all corners of the world to virtual Manchester. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much and have a, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Marcosi, Sante. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> Bye. You, I don't know how to say thank you in Welsh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that one as well. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.